Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to today's edition of Batcast. Today is uh, Tuesday, September 25, 2023. I'm Rifat Manan in California, and I'm remotely joined by my good friend Emilio Madrigal, who is in Boston. Today, we are very delighted to welcome Dr. Matthew Elkins, who is Director of Transfusion Medicine at Sunny Upstate Medical University in New York. And we are also joined by pathology residents at Rutgers. And uh, thanks to the residents who are joining us today. And today, Dr. Elkins is going to give a talk on blood bank. And the title of, her, of his talk is Transfusion Reactions Overview. And as always, please feel free to post your questions and comments on YouTube and Facebook chat windows and we will pass them over to Dr. Alkins at the end of the talk. And thank you, Dr. Alkins, for joining us today. Over to you now. Thank you so much. Um, wonderful introduction, um, and it's great to be here. Looking forward to first uh, pathcast from me. Hopefully not the last one. Uh, it depends on how badly I do. Uh, so good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on where you're at. Um, this uh, this is Matt Elkins. I'm a pathologist up here, and we are in New York, but we are in Syracuse, just in case there's any confusion. So today we're going to talk about transfusion reactions. Um, now, one of the biggest sources of confusion in life, but certainly in medicine, is miscommunication, right? Almost every uh, issue that we run into, there's a communication issue somewhere in there, right? Um, every every problem. So I always like to define, what are we talking about? Transfusion reactions are anything where there is a negative, unexpected reaction to transfusion of a blood product. I've had people call and say, well, we think of a transfusion reaction. The patient's feeling really good. Like, no, if it's something extra positive, no, we're not going to investigate that. Uh, we can make the patient feel worse if you want, but that's, that's not appropriate, right? We've also had, um, when the uh, unexpected is another point. So if you're having expected changes of a transfusion of a blood product, that's not a transfusion reaction. That is an expected change. That's that's an expected effect of the transfusion. Then I get some of the calls where they haven't been transfused. I just hang up on those because you can't have a transfusion you know, reaction without a transfusion. Okay, so I, and I define that simply because there are recognize that most of our clinical colleagues, nurses, physicians from other backgrounds, they, if they've, most of them will never think of transfusion reactions. They've never heard of it. They don't know what you're talking about and it's never entered their differential. However, if some, if people have heard of transfusion reactions, they've only heard of the first one we're gonna talk about, which is a hemolytic transfusion reaction. And I've had nurses say, oh, it's not, there's no hemolysis, so there's no transfusion reaction. No. Transfusion reaction is any negative unexpected reaction to transfusion. So if we look at, this is a list of the transfusion reactions we're hopefully going to get to today. Now we're going to spend the most time on the first one because it's the one that's always on boards. And it's the reason we do a lot of what we do in blood bank is to prevent these hemolytic transfusion reactions. So we will spend the most time on that one because we're also going to use it as a comparison for a number of the other transfusion reactions. Um, so we'll get the first one out of the way. Um, the, the rest of them we will go faster on, I promise, it won't last all day. So first one is the hemolytic transfusion reaction. This is where there are red cells with an antigen and antibodies that recognize that antigen in somebody's bloodstream at the same time. Now, the example I'm going to use is the most common where we are giving donor red cells that have an antigen into a patient that has antibodies uh, that recognize that antigen. Now you can absolutely have the reverse where we have given plasma, so antibodies that recognize the patient's red cell, an antigen on the patient's red cells. Um, most commonly that would be when we're giving incompatible platelets. If you give an O platelet to someone who's not an O, there's a lot of anti-A and anti-B and that can absolutely cause hemolysis. However, the majority of cases are just what we're showing here where we gave incompatible red cells. So you transfuse those and not surprisingly, the antibodies bind to the antigens they're targeted against. And then the, the patient's own uh, innate immune system are going to result in lysis of those red cells. The antibody coated red cells get destroyed either intravascularly by complement in the membrane attack complex or extravascularly by the reticular endothelial system. And you get lysis of the red cells. You know, these decide to be rectangles today. Sometimes they're Ovals today, they're rectangles. That's the free hemoglobin. 
Um, now, a lot is made between whether the hemolysis is intravascular and extravascular. And if it is a low level of hemolysis, it does matter because extravascular, the uh, cells have already been taken up into macrophages and then the lysed uh, red cells, the free hemoglobin stays in inside those cells and outside of circulation. Whereas intravascular, all of that free hemoglobin goes out into circulation. However, when there is the level of hemolysis that we're talking about for a hemolytic transfusion reaction, there's too much hemolysis for that free hemoglobin, free hemoglobin to be retained in the reticular endothelial system, and you're going to get free hemoglobin. And that free hemoglobin from those lysed red cells, either directly released in the membrane TAC complex, intravascular, or extravascular, but then leaking back out into the, the bloodstream, that's what's going to cause the symptoms of this reaction. So how do these patients look? You get fevers, chills, rigors, flank pain, and that is the kidneys screaming. That can be diaphoresis, shortness of breath. Um, the impending sense of doom are uh, med students. When I give this for our medical uh, students, they often chuckle at that because they haven't been in the ICU. If a patient tells you they feel like they're going to die, they might be right. That is a interpretation of the uh, cytokine cascade. They are in SIRS. That's bad. So this can be bad. It can lead to things like kidney damage, pain, SIRS shock, and even death. A um, couple hundred fatalities due to these hemolytic transfusion reactions every year in the US. Um, it's only a couple hundred considering how many transfusions we give. That's a small percentage. It's a small rate, but it's still 200 people. Um, all of this really goes back to the free hemoglobin that is sorry, free hemoglobin that is released from the lysed red cells. And this free hemoglobin causes symptoms both directly and indirectly. The organ that is most sensitive to hemoglobin is actually the kidney. The kidney tubule epithelium is really primed to get damaged by free hemoglobin. And that is a whole nother hour talk on why the kidney is so sensitive to free hemoglobin and why it causes such damage, but I don't have time to go into it. So um, just recognize the kidney is the first thing and the, the thing that we're most worried about in a um, patient who's having massive amount of hemolysis, whether it's due to hemolytic transfusion reaction or any amount of free hemoglobin, because this can be temporary damage or it can be permanent. We actually had a patient here just a couple of years ago was not a hemolytic transfusion reaction, but due to autoimmune hemolysis that had so much free hemoglobin that she lost both kidneys. Um, thankfully, after years, she started to get some uh, kidney function back. Amazingly, we weren't expecting that, but recognize you get enough free hemoglobin. The kidneys are so sensitive that they can actually have uh, permanent kidney damage. So, uh, so this, sorry. So this is very important to know, but this kidney damage doesn't really explain this presentation, right? Sure, the flank pain, that makes sense. Anuria, hematuria, sure. But why fevers, chills, rigors? Well, the thing to recognize is that free hemoglobin will bind to nitric oxide. Remember, your endothelial cells make nitric oxide as a locally, active, locally acting vasodilator and mild anticoagulant. Um, but when hemoglobin binds to met hem to nitric oxide and makes met hemoglobin, met hemoglobin is a powerful inducer of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, this is where you get your fevers, chills, and SIRS. So it's important to recognize that the clinical presentation of a acute uh, hemolytic transfusion reaction is due to the patient making cytokines. That's important as we look at other transfusion reactions. Um, Another note is if you have massive hemolysis, you're going to scavenge so much nitric oxide that you'll actually can be deficient in nitric oxide, resulting in increased vascular tone, hypercoagulability. This is one of a couple dozen reasons why acute hemolysis can result in hypercoagulability and thrombi. Now, I want to take a slight step to the side and talk about acute versus delayed. So when people think about hemolytic transfusion reactions, Usually people are going to think about acute hemolytic transfusion reactions, um, but you can also have it presenting delay. The heck do I mean by that? So the time of presentation, the time when you will actually see these symptoms, the fevers, chills, rigors, SIRS, flank pain, et cetera, 
really depends on how much antibody titer is present at the time of transfusion. So the easy one to think about is if you have an O patient and you give them B red cells, as you are doing the, as you are administering the transfusion, each B red cell, I'm sorry, yeah, B red cell, so red cells with a B antigen on them, as they get into the patient's bloodstream, there's a bunch of anti-B antibody ready to coat that red cell and lysis is gonna happen right now. So it's easy to think about those. However, we can also have delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions. And this is when at the time of transfusion, the antibody titer is low. So it's not in the ABO antibodies, um, but let's say for example, that the patient, Mr. X, because uh, always Mr. X. Um, so Mr. No, we'll go Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith got a transfusion 20 years ago when he was in the army, and as a response to that transfusion, made an anti-Kel. We're not going to go into a different Kel. That's a different question. If you don't know about Kel, you need to learn about. It. Um, but he made that antibody, but in the intervening 20 years, he hasn't been exposed to the Kel antigen again, because the Kel protein is expressed on red cells. It's expressed on human red cells. You don't get exposed to it outside in other environments. So in those intervening 20 years, his antibody titer has fallen to the point that it's not detectable. So we do a type in screen, screen's negative. We don't find an anti-Kel because the titer is so low. Now we transfuse and by bad luck, we give a unit that is positive for the Kel antigen. Well, at the time of transfusion, there's not a lot of antibodies waiting for those red cells to come in. So there won't be an acute hemolysis during the transfusion, but once those red cells are in circulation, those memory B cells are going to recognize that this is a foreign antigen and gonna start developing anti-Kel antibodies. And that anamnestic reaction will lead to a rapid increase in anti-Kel antibodies. And as that titer gets high enough, you're gonna see hemolysis of those transfused red cells. So I include this because um, again, most clinicians and nursing and staff don't think about transfusion reactions, but if they do, they're only gonna think about it during the transfusion. If it's after the transfusion, whether it's hours or days after the transfusion, Nobody's going to think about these delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions. That's why you have to, right? We have to, from, from the pathology, from the blood bank side, bring this up as a potential to have it in their differential. So which one's worse? Uh, neither, both. So in an acute reaction, you're going to hemolyze everything that you transfuse. However, if you're having symptoms, hopefully they're going to stop the transfusion. And so that minimizes how much of that unit is transfused into the patient. And the amount transfused correlates to how much free hemoglobin is present in circulation at any one time. And that's going to, and the amount of free hemoglobin at any one time determines how bad the reaction is and how much damage is caused. Now, if you look at a delayed reaction, by definition, you finish that transfusion. So they have a whole unit of red cells or more than one unit of red cells in their circulation that they're going to lyse. Now, the good thing with a delayed is if the antibody titer rises very slowly, then hemolysis will go through, will, will happen very slowly. And the level of free hemoglobin will never get to such high peaks as you got with the acute reaction. So which one's worse? It depends. Um, if you get an acute reaction, shortly into the transfusion, they get very little in, that may be relatively mild. You get a delayed reaction where, particularly with the, the KID, the, so JKA, JKB group, these are kind of known for having a very brisk anamnestic response, and the titer shoots up from unde undetectable up to unmeasurable, um, and you hemolyze all of that unit or multiple units within the space of an hour, that may be a higher level of free hemoglobin. Or you can have acutes that are terrible. You can have delays that are really mild. But it's important to understand the, the difference here. Now, you, you may go to some meetings, and I, I've actually seen people stand up and pound on the table and uh, swear and things of what we should call and where is the threshold. When So if, it's, if the reaction is during the transfusion, it's acute. If it's the next day, it's delayed. 
Well, what if it's a few hours delayed? Is that still acute? Is it a delayed acute? Is it acute delayed? I don't care. I really don't. I don't understand why people argue about it. Give it another name. Call it George. It doesn't matter what you call it. The important thing is you're recognizing the pathophysiology that has led to the symptomatology because that tells you what to do about it. So that was too much. Sorry, I get on uh, soapboxes. I'll get on to the next one. So how do we figure out whether there is hemolysis going on? So if this is a hemolytic transfusion reaction, you're going to see free hemoglobin in the serum. And once it's had time to go through circulation, you will see it in the urine. You can do other laboratory testing, like looking for haptoglobin. You'll see that decreased as it helps to scavenge the, the hemoglobin dimers, um, increased LDH and increased bilirubin. Take a CBC. If you gave a unit of red cells and you went from seven to eight, there wasn't a whole lot of hemolysis. You went from seven to seven, maybe there was hemolysis. You can do a DAT, right? A direct Coombs test or direct antiglobulin test looking for IgG and C3, where you add anti-IgG, you look for agglutination. If we have a positive DAT with anti-IgG, we can make an eluate, strip off these antibodies and figure out the specificity of it. And all of these, all this testing is helpful and useful. However, in the moment, when the when you have Mr. Smith up on the floor that suddenly had diaphoresis and flank pain, and you've got to figure out is this a hemolytic transfusion reaction? Your number one thing is figuring out, is there free hemoglobin? And that's not ordering a quantitative serum hemoglobin. What we do and what is done at most institutions is you get a tube. We use pink top tube. Some people use lavender. You get the normal tube you use for type and screen and spin it and look at it. We Here we call that our hemolysis check. That's what's called most institutions, but it may differ at your institution. So the important thing to know is in a 70 kilo patient, five liter blood volume nominally, if you have 30 mLs of hemolysis, then the plasma goes from looking like apple juice, right? A nice yellow to pink. It is a detectable pink coloration. So getting that uh, tube drawn from Mr. Smith, spinning it and looking at it takes minutes. And if that serum is yellow, there is no hemolysis going on. We have ruled it out. We'll still do the rest of the testing because we're laboratorians and we're OCD, so we have to do them. Um, but realistically, we've made our determination. If it's red, then you want to make sure it wasn't a bad stick. You always want to compare it to the pre-transfusion sample, make sure this wasn't a patient that was already hemolyzing. Um, but that is really our most useful because it gives us information in the, the best time frame for intervention. So if we do figure out that this patient is having acute hemolysis, having a hemolytic transfusion reaction, the most important thing is to protect the kidneys. And the only way to get that free hemoglobin out of the kidneys is, is with hydration, right? It's out into the urine. So you want to give hydration, 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 and keep going with hydration until the urine's clear. Um, the patient may not like you because they keep having to go pee, but they will like you even less if you put them on dialysis because uh, you killed their kidneys. Uh, in the future, right? don't give red cells that have the antigen or don't give the, the plasma that has antibodies. Right, that, That's why we have so many of our processes in the blood bank and in transfusion medicine to prevent these reactions from happening. So they do still happen. The most common cause for them is unfortunately clerical error. The most common cause, um, sadly, we have an acronym for it, right? WBIT, wrong blood, right? It's Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones um, both get tubes of blood, blood drawn, but Mr. Jones' label gets put on Mr. Smith's tube. And despite what I've been told from nurses, once the tube gets to the lab, we cannot tell the difference. Every patient's blood is red. It all looks the same. Um, so we have no way of knowing it's wrong, which is why the FDA actually requires a second sampling done sometime in the patient's history to at least use the blood type to make sure it's the right patient. But it still happens, um, still happens far too frequently. Second, uh, there we go. Second most common cause for these hemolytic transfusion reactions is another clerical error. So we still got Mr. Jones and Mr. Smith up in the uh, medical ICU. They got their tubes of blood, but there nothing was wrong with the labeling. It, was, it wasn't the first one. Mr. Smith's blood got tested, Mr. Jones' blood got tested. 
no problems there. But then each of them, a unit of red cells is ordered for each patient, Mr. Jones and Mr. Smith. And Mr. Smith's nurse happens to be walking by the uh, pneumatic tube system when Mr. Jones's blood is delivered. And Smith's nurse said, oh, I'm waiting for blood. That's probably mine. Takes it to the patient and transfuses it into the wrong patient. Um, there is a requirement for a double check by nursing at the time of um, infusion. But right, anything like that that's always been right means people aren't actually paying attention. So that's why there are systems out there to get a computer double check where you have to scan the patient, scan the unit, but not every institution has that. So there needs to be a double check to make sure we're giving it right at the time of administration. And it also happens testing error, right? Um, nothing is perfect, including laboratory, although we don't tell that to our clinicians. Um, so there are always potential issues with testing error. That's why we have so much redundancy in blood bank and in testing uh, to make sure that we minimize this as much as humanly possible. Okay, so that is the first transfusion reaction. Like I say, we won't take nearly as long with the rest of them, but hopefully that all makes sense because we're gonna be, <clears throat> we're gonna be uh, comparing some of the other transfusion reactions to that one. And like I say, you will deal with these for the rest of your career and certainly on boards uh, and RISE and any other standardized test. Okay, so the first one we care about because it kills people. Second one doesn't kill people, but we care about it because it looks like the first one. So for a lot of our transfusion reactions, we're talking about, we're trying to give stuff from the donor. So this, the red cells, the platelets, the coagulation factors in the plasma, but there's something else along for the ride. Um, so in a febrile non hemolytic transfusion reaction, what's along for the ride is cytokines. And these cytokines came from the white cells that were in the whole blood. But before it got to the point of getting leukoreduced, those white cells lysed, or the 0.1% of white cells that are left in there after leukoreduction, they lysed. And the recognized white cells are big bags of cytokines. That's what you want them to have normally, but not when they're stored blood. But recognize there is no scavenging that's happening in those blood products. So those cytokines will just hang around. So those get infused along with the platelets or red cells or coag factors. And guess what? Your cytokines look like my cytokines. So the recipient, the transfusion recipient, they're gonna to respond to those cytokines as if they were endogenously derived cytokines and they're gonna respond to it. Um, and there's a bunch of different responses you can see. Um, I don't, and I don't really like the name febrile non-hemolytic, even though fever is the most common cause, but it's not a hundred percent. And I've had, <clears throat> we'll call them discussions with some of my clinicians in nursing, where they say, well, it can't be a febrile reaction because the patient wasn't fit, didn't become febrile. Like, I, I understand, but they had cytokine reactions. So what do I mean by that? So how do these patients look clinically? Most commonly, fevers, chills, rigors, uh, but it can look anything like the um, any sort of cytokine response. It's a pro-inflammatory cytokine bolus. So they respond to that. And again, what does this look like? This looks like the last one. This looked like that hemolytic transfusion reaction because both reactions are going to present with the same symptomatology because it's being driven by the same cytokines. The difference here is there's no free hemoglobin in either urine or serum, and there is not an ongoing production of those cytokines. It's just a bolus from what was infused in that transfusion, and then those go away. Recognize those cytokines have very short half-life. Um, these reactions will resolve spontaneously, Quite honestly, um, in our healthcare setting, they don't get a chance to resolve spontaneously. We give these patients Tylenol and all kinds of other things, and then we pat ourselves on the back that we helped cure it. Um, I have not seen any studies that have actually shown, does Tylenol actually help these resolve faster? Or is it more a matter of, well, we did something and therefore it worked, so therefore that was what did it. That's magical thinking. Um, so I think we're giving, we're probably giving a lot of Tylenol, but it makes us feel better. It makes the patient feel better because we did something and they're feeling better now. So that must've been what done it. But these, these should resolve spontaneously. If you're seeing symptoms that are lasting 
more than an hour, more than 90 minutes, um, or if they're getting worse, that is not a febrile non-hemolytic because it should be the largest bolus, the largest concentration of those cytokines should be at the time of transfusion. As soon as you stop the transfusion, those levels should be falling. And so symptoms should be declining, not increasing. Now, if you do have a febrile non-hemolytic reaction, there's no need for special blood products. Um, now, the one caveat to this is if you are at an institution that does not do universal leukoreduction, then you should be. There's really no downside to doing leukoreduction. And it gets rid of, based on the, the data we have, gets rid of about 75% of these reactions, um, as well as decreasing the rate of HLA sensitization, decreasing CMV transmit. There's all kinds of good things about leukoreduction. If your institution is not doing universal leukoreduction, you should encourage them that they should. Um, but within leukoreduction, it's not that we gave them the wrong blood type. It's not that we gave them bad blood. That, that unit happened to have a slightly larger concentration of cytokines and or that patient is a little more sensitive to those cytokines. Historically, this was the reason that we pre-medicated with Tylenol. And there's all kinds of literature, including from former faculty here at SUNY Upstate in Syracuse, uh, looking at, well, what's the financial benefits and should we, should we not? Is there risk that Tylenol um, masks our hemolytic transfusion reactions and what uh, back and forth over the, the relative risks benefits? But all of that literature is predicated on the assumption that giving Tylenol as a pre-medication actually prevents these reactions. And thankfully we have real data because there's people who actually ask this question. Um, Nice art. Um, there's a really nice uh, um, summary of multiple RCTs, but one of the largest ones, uh, one of the largest trials was actually done down at Hopkins. It, like I say, it's been reviewed and there is, I believe, even a cock. I'm not sure if it's Cochrane review, but there's been reviews of multiple different RCTs showing that premedication with Tylenol makes us feel better, does nothing for the patient, doesn't affect incidence or severity of these febrile reactions. And that's true regardless of whether the patient has had a prior history of allergic reaction of febrile eh, history of febrile reactions or never had one before. Oh, well, he had a reaction, so we've got to pre-medicate for the next one. No, it doesn't do anything. Just expose them to Tylenol. And unfortunately, this goes back into the magical thinking of, oh, well, the patient had a reaction once. We've given him Tylenol ever since, and he's never had a reaction. It's magical thinking. That's why the the, the strength of randomized controlled trials, because you don't know the true rate and you don't know the true impact of your intervention unless you're using randomized control data. Um, otherwise it's, you know, the patient, yes, they reacted to that one and they wouldn't have reacted to any of the other ones. The Tylenol just gave them more Tylenol. Okay, so like I said, the after the first one, these go a little bit faster. That was their second reaction. So the first one kills people. Second one doesn't kill people, but it looks like the one that kills people. Third one, we've got another one that kills people. So this is trolley. So in this reaction, what we're, what's coming across with the red cells, platelets, coagulant factors, what you're trying to give the patient are antibodies. And these are anti-HLA antibodies. So this is a donor who has been sensitized to someone else's HLA and they've made HLA antibodies. Those get transfused into the, into the patient by bad luck, happenstance, providence, whatever. Um, those HLA antibodies recognize the HLA of the transfusion recipient. Uh, this is another topic that's an hour all by itself um, and still not completely elucidated. There's multiple mechanisms, um, but recognize the binding of these antibodies, the inter I should say, the interaction of these antibodies with the patient's um, white cells, particularly neutrophils, that's why three of the three neutrophils, never mind. Um, that actually results in activation of the of the neutrophils. So you get um, the neutrophils activating, binding to the endothelial cells, diapodesi, exiting the circulatory system, and releasing all kinds of cytokines. And these cytokines result in pulmonary edema, right? They're increasing vascular permeability as well as vasodilation, you get edema. Recognize that this is really a body-wide phenomenon. But if a patient gets swelling in their leg, we put it on a pillow and go on to the next patient. But if they dump a liter of fluid into their interstitium of their lungs, that's a bigger deal. 
So how do these patients look clinically? So acute severe hypoxia. So radiology 101, and obviously this is not for my patient, so there's no HPI here. So radiology 101, normal, not normal, right? This is what they call the whiteout of trolley, where it is everywhere. Um, it is not the classic butterfly that you see with CHF, because CHF, you're getting accentuation of the major vasculature. Trolley happens at the capillaries, so that's why it's happening everywhere. And I would tell you this is not the worst one I've seen, but um, I don't have a picture of the worst one I saw. But when you know when you're looking at a chest X-ray, you always look at the humerus to make sure you're getting good penetration of the X-rays. We had good penetration, but we couldn't see a single rib outline. The patient had dumped so much fluid into their lungs that it was essentially the the density and some of bone. That's bad when your lungs are as dense as bone and the patient did not do well, the patient passed away. Uh, that was another trolley, fa trolley fatality that I saw back in training. So this is what looks on x-ray. So acute, this acute severe hypoxia, if you get their blood pressure right away, you can see an increase in blood pressure. That's because they're drowning and they're panicking. Much more commonly, so you'll actually see a drop in blood pressure, not because they're not drowning, but because they're hypovolemic. Their intravascular volume has decreased to the point that they cannot maintain their blood pressure. And that's because all their fluid's gone out into their tissues, in the lungs and every other tissue, because again, this is a body-wide phenomenon. And this can be bad where it requires intubation, mechanical ventilation, and it can be very bad. Now I got to update this, this phrase, because this, this is no longer true. Um, this is most years is the second most fatal. It goes back, went back and forth for a number of years with the next transfusion reaction, which is the major um, different, uh, differential for trolley reactions. But it still does cause, it's one of the leading causes of fatal transfusion reactions in the US. This number though, is also incorrect. And this highlights the danger of trolley. So it's not that there's a problem with the numerator on this 10%, it's the denominator. Recognize that most people don't know, they've never heard of trolley. They don't know what it is. They don't know what it looks like, which means they can never, right? You can never diagnose something you've never heard of. If it's not in your differential, you will never know, you will never see it. I tell you, I started here at SUNY Upstate 10 years ago. And you know how many trolley reactions had ever been reported before I started? That would be zero. You know how many trolley reactions they'd had? Not zero. <laughs> they'd had them, but nobody knew about them and nobody knew to look for them. So they weren't being reported. So there are more trolley reactions out there. You can look at it similar to COVID, right? Initially, COVID was thought to be horribly fatal. The percent was terrible. That was because we didn't know about all the mild cases. And it's true of any new diagnosis. We always know about the most about the worst case. So if we do figure out this a trolley reaction, there's no change of transfusion for future recipients, right? You you do supportive care. This is um, so I've had people say, oh, this isn't trolley, it's ARDS. Uh, ARDS is a description. Trolley is a type of ARDS, acute respiratory distress, distress syndrome caused by transfusion. So you could say it's transfusion related ARDS. So yes, it looks exactly the same. Um, the good thing is for all the causes of ARDS, trolley actually patients do better because it's not smoke inhalation, it's not thermal burns or chemical burns. Um, it is an acute reaction that hopefully should be self-limited because those cytokines should calm down if you can help the patient survive the initial um, insult. So for future transfusions, there's no change for the recipient, but there needs to be a change for that donor. So we need to identify that this is a trolley reaction so we can work with our blood supplier to identify that donor and make sure that, that the blood from that donor is not given to future patients because we don't want to have a fatality. You know how they figured out that trolley was a transfusion reaction? What was going on? I figured out the mechanism. It was a population study. It was west of DC. I don't remember exactly where, but they found that there were six trolley reactions, four of which were fatal all from donations from a single donor. And that donor went every eight weeks to donate whole blood, which was great, except that the antibodies in that donor's uh, circulation was resulting in fatalities. 
<laughs> we need to identify those donors, thank them profusely, shake their hand, but ask them not to donate anymore, right? Because they are, their blood is now a risk. Okay, um, so that's trolley. Now the major differential with trolley is taco. And this is about lunchtime where I am. Um, taco is not as tasty as it sounds, sorry. This is transfusion so associated circulatory overload. This is essentially, we have induced a CHF exacerbation, right? This is transfusion of too much into somebody who cannot handle it. Too much, too fast in somebody who can't compensate. You get volume overload and it backs up into the lowest pressure point in the system, which is our pulmonary system, right? So you get pulmonary edema. So this, you know, what's the classic on this? It's a, the little lady that comes in altered mental status. Uh, we don't know any history on her. Oh no, um, she's probably hypovolemic. Let's get a couple uh, units, uh, you know, a liter of normal saline in. Oh good. Oh, the, the first CVC came back. She's got a hemoglobin of four. Oh, we got to pump some red cells into her. So you get some red cells into her. And then it's, it's usually the med student at the other end of the ED that's actually looking in the history. Like, oh, we actually do know this patient. She's got, she's got the, this patient has CHF. And her ejection fraction is 5%, right? And now they look at the table and the patient's drowning. Why? Because all that fluid they put in has now gone to the lungs and they're over, they've overloaded. So that's a little easier to understand and easier to um, diagnose. There's another way this presents. It's typically patients who are do have CHF, pre-existing, long-standing CHF, but now they've been in the hospital. They've been admitted for their CHF exacerbation for the last week, and they've been using diuretics. They've gotten uh, two liters off of the patient, but now they gave a unit of red cells and suddenly they can't breathe. We call up and say, oh, this, I think this could be overload. Like you weren't listening. You, you, the patient's two liters negative. We only gave 300 mLs of red cells. Right, but it wasn't 300 mLs of saline. This was 300 mLs of red cells. And red cells provide a large oncotic pressure, right? Normally we think of oncotic pressure as the proteins, the albumin and the other proteins in the plasma, but red cells themselves provide a large oncotic pressure. And when you're giving a red cell unit, that is a lot of red cells. Those are concentrated red cells. And that can make a huge, an, an abrupt acute change in their oncotic pressure, which can mobilize fluid that is still in the periphery, right? And these CHF patients still have fluid out in their periphery. You mobilize that, it leads back to their, their heart. They still have CHF, they cannot handle that in, acute increase in blood volume. And so it backs up into their lungs. This is a much harder one to explain over the phone to an intern at 2 a.m. on a Saturday. Uh, don't ask me how I know that. <laughs> It is much harder to explain, but it happens a lot. We see these CHF patients and they give a unit like, oh, we don't have to worry about volume because they're so net negative. We can give it over an hour. And then they go into respiratory compromise and failure. Um, really recognize the, the um, oncotic load and the intravascular pressure challenge that blood products um, represent is not the same as this, uh, 300 mLs of normal saline. It's not the same. Okay, so circulatory overload. What do you see? Well, you've all seen CHF exacerbations. If you haven't, just wait, you will. Um, increased blood pressure, shortness of breath, pulmonary edema. And the big thing is to rule out trolley. You have to differentiate trolley from taco. And the reason for that is that the interventions are completely different. If it is circulatory overload, you're gonna be giving di diuretics. Remember that trolley patient, they uh, are hy intravascularly hypovol uh, hypovolemic. Their intravascular volume is decreased because it's all out in the, in the periphery. You give them Lasix, their kidneys are still going to respond. They're going to get rid of more intravascular volume. You can put them into a um, severe hypotensive crisis. So don't do that. Don't give Lasix to trolley patients. So there's a number of things you can look at. You can look at blood pressure, shortness of breath. You can look at the chest X-ray. One of the things I always try to point out when I'm talking with my clinicians is you can also use BNP, the uh, brain natriuretic peptide or pro-BNP, whichever one you want to use, because uh, that is a measure of atrial pressure, right heart strain. So you say, oh, well, the patient had this transfusion reaction. We drew a BNP and it was 1,000. Well, that doesn't tell you whether it is overload or trolley. 
because you need to know what the baseline is. And this is the reason I bring this up for my clinical colleagues is remember that they've got at least one tube out there from before the transfusion. If nothing else, they've got the type and screen. And we can run a BNP off of that same sample. And you now you have a pre and a post. And if the pre-transfusion uh, BNP was 1,000, post-transfusion is 1,000, it is not overload. You're looking at trolley. If the pre was 200 and the post is 1,000, you're looking at overload. So using BNP, there's, there's nice publications showing that use of BNP can increase your sensitivity and specificity of making this differential between trolley and taco by about 10% on both sides. So if you figure out that with whatever measures, using BNP, using whatever evidence, you figure out that it's overload, here you would do just like you would for any CHF exacerbation. Treatment is supportive, possibly diuretics. In the future, run the transfusion slowly. Um, remind your clinicians that they do have, per FDA, you have up to four hours from when the blood product leaves your blood bank or whatever uh, monitored storage you have. If four hours is still not long enough, most blood banks, and can't say all, check with your blood bank, are able to split units, right? We normally talk about splitting units for pediatric, but you use the same thing for these CHF patients that cannot handle it. You split a unit, give them half a unit, give them a third of a unit, give a fourth of a unit. The rest of that unit goes back in the fridge and the uh, four hour time limit has not started on the rest of that unit. So you can give one unit over longer than four hours as long as each aliquot that comes out of our blood bank's control is transfused under that four hour limit. That's probably confusing. Maybe replay this a second time oh, or give me a call. So if a patient does have overload, it's not because we got the wrong ABO. It's not because of antibodies. It's just too much, too fast. Somebody couldn't handle it. Okay. Um, hopefully some of that was not confusing. <laughs> uh, so our next transfusion reaction is another one that results in fatalities. And this is transfusion of blood products, most commonly reported with platelets, at least percentage-wise, that are, are contaminated with bacteria and enough bacteria to cause an immediate reaction. The assumption is that every donation has bacteria in it. Why? Because we get it from people. We go through their antecubital vein. There is probably some bacteria that gets into every blood um, donation. But as long as there's not enough of that bacteria at the time of transfusion, the recipient's immune system will take care of that bacteria and we won't see a reaction. So these are the ones where there is enough bacteria that you're actually causing acute reaction. So we use it as platelets. Yes, that's my picture of platelets um, that have been contaminated with bacteria. They get transfused. What's going to happen? The patient's immune system is going to recognize the bacteria and they're going to respond to it as they should. The patients will look septic. Why? Because we made them septic. We put bacteria into their bloodstream. They're now septic. <laughs> so this is most commonly... And certainly on boards and on rise, they're going to talk about platelets. And percentage-wise, this is, or historically, has been more commonly seen with platelets because platelets are kept at room temperature, which allow the growth of the most common contaminants, which are skin uh, flora, mostly staph strains. So that's not surprising. Um, this is less of a problem now. There's, for those of you who are not aware, there was a change to the FDA right in time with COVID, so it's been delayed as full implementation um, to really address this particularly with platelets. But you can also see this with red cells. If the contamination is with bacteria that can grow at four degrees where red cells are maintained, you can absolutely see septic reactions with red cells. Percentage-wise, because we give a lot more red cells, percentage-wise, it is a low risk with red cells. But overall, if you look at the incidence of septic reactions with platelets, septic reactions with red cells, they're kind of similar number of cases. The thing is, percentage-wise, it's much more common with platelets, or has been. We'll talk about that in a second. So how do these patients look? They look septic. Again, if you haven't seen a septic patient, just wait, you will. <laughs> um, and these can be very severe up to organ shock, and, uh, organ failure and shock and death. Uh, if we're suspecting this type of transfusion reaction, we really want to get a gram stain culture of both the bag and the recipient. Um, the reason we want to do both is 
we want to test the unit and the patient to confirm that it is the same uh, organism to make sure that it was actually coming from the unit. Now I have people say, well, let's just culture the bag and whatever we find in the bag, that must be what's happening, what's infecting the patient. Yeah, in an ideal world, um, that would work. The because in an ideal world, the patient would have this reaction looking like this, and the bag and tubing would be disconnected still together, put into a sterile bag, brought down to the blood bank, taken over still in that sterile bag to microbiology, they'll put it under a hood, and able to de to undock the uh, administration set from the, the unit, swab the unit, and um, uh, that's, what the, that's what they'll grow for their, you know, inoculate into their blood cultures. What really happens is they see a patient like this and everybody grabs the unit and the tubing and everything, rips it all apart, throws it into a bag, into the, I'm sorry, not into a bag, into the trash. And the blood bank staff is calling up for a couple hours to say, hey, we need that unit. Can you send us the unit? They're like, well, we're taking care of a patient. It looks like this. We'll get to it when we get to it. So four hours later, uh, somebody says, oh, okay, we need to get the unit. So they pull it out of the trash and hand it to the blood bank. Uh, well, guess what? We're going to culture in microbiology is whatever happened to be in the trash, whatever happened to be touching that access port. So we don't want to just do that. Well, the flip side, well, why don't we just culture the patient and whatever grows, what must have come from the unit? Because they were fine. And then we started the transfusion and they looked like this. So it must have been the unit. Not really. <laughs> and the, the problem with this is that a lot of our transfusions are given through indwelling lines. Uh, whether it's central lines or peripheral IVs, whatever. Um, and I, I can tell you our uh, ID folk don't, don't like me saying this, but it's true. Infected lines are much more common than infected units. And the worry there is if we assume that the bacteria growing in the patient circulation came from that unit, they might not take that line out. And it might've been the line and they need to remove that line because that might be that's much more likely to be the source of infection. So that's why we want to do gram stain culture of both the unit and the patient to make sure we know what we're treating and we know where it came from. So if we have a bacterial contamination unit or a septic transfusion reaction, there's no change for the recipient or the donor. This was just bad luck. But historically, there has been a monitoring system for platelets, um, like say over the last Hmm, three, four years now, um, there has been a, a push from the FDA to change to a new system, which you can use a monitoring system, but it's become much more strict and much more restrictive. Or you can go to um, treating platelet units with one of the systems that's on the market that inactivates all pathogens. It's called pathogen inactivation system, and it will kill any bacteria that's in there. Um, a lot of places we're a Red Cross center here. That's fine. A lot of places are, some aren't. Um, I can tell you Red Cross has gone to 100% pathogen inactivated platelets, which I'm all for. That's probably the best way to go. But wherever your system is, whatever their um, intervention is to prevent, to be compliant with the FDA and prevent these septic reactions, we do expect there to be a massive drop in septic reactions due to platelet transfusions in the future, which is a good thing. That's better patient care. Okay. Uh, next reaction. So next one is allergic reactions. And this reaction, along with our febrile reactions, is by far and away the most common types of transfusion reactions. And there's two ways you see a transfusion react, an allergic transfusion reaction. First one is if uh, uh, we have a donor, um, usually I pick on somebody in the audience, but I don't know the audience, so I'm not going to. Um, if we have Mr. Smith is our, now our donor, and uh, Mr. Smith says, you know what, I'm going to go in and donate. And one of the things we always tell people before they donate is to have something to eat. So he has his peanut butter and jelly sandwich, feels great, goes in, donates, no problem. And the donation goes well, separation of different blood products goes well, and storage is fine. And then they transfuse into a patient, but it happens to be that patient has an, a peanut allergy and recognize that food that you eat, allergens get into your bloodstream. Medications that you're on, those are allergens that are in your bloodstream. Inhaled allergens from the environment, those are in your bloodstream. So uh, if that ha if it just so happens that in the plasma of the uh, red cell, pl platelet, plasma, whatever we're giving, 
there happens to be an allergen the patient's pre previously sensitized to, they're going to recognize that allergen and they're going to have an allergic reaction. Um, now, there is another way that we can see this happen. Uh, there are some people like myself who are um, <sighs> lucky enough to have seasonal allergies. I actually have all four seasons. Um, I think I'm working on being allergic to a fifth season. I don't know which, what, which season that is, probably baseball season. Um, but I'm used to it. I've had seasonal allergies for over 40 years. Um, so I feel fine with a level of histamine that other people may not. So when I go in and give a donation, there is preformed histamine that is stable in plasma. If that gets transfused into someone who's not as used to that level of histamine, they may have an allergic reaction. Because they're just they're going to again their system's able to respond to the histamine just like it would endogenous histamine. So either of these is possible. Now, if we're talking about a mild localized reaction, a little localized itching, some hives, a few hot, it could be either one of these. If we're talking about anaphylactic reaction, it is this one. I do not have enough histamine in my system to cause somebody to go into anaphylaxis. Okay, so what do they look clinically? Wide range. Um, my, one of my favorite calls is when they have a single hive. It's usually, oh, we think the patient's having an allergic reaction to the transfusion. Well, why? Well, they've got a hive. Where is it? It's on their hand where we took the, where we had the tape for the IV. No, that would be an allergy to the tape. Um, allergic reactions when it is a central exposure, we typically expect a central um, presentation, typically trunk, so chest, back, neck, head. That's where we typically see hives initially, certainly can widespread, can be body-wide, and can go all the way up, but these reactions can all be all the way up to anaphylaxis with shock and organ dysfunction. These reactions are gonna be treated just like they were any other allergic reaction. Um, and for most practices, uh, there's no changes to transfusion, to transfusion practice. Again, same RCT that we talked about for uh, pre-medication with Tylenol, same thing was shown with Benadryl. Um, Benadryl premedication doesn't do anything. It dopes up your patient, so maybe they're asleep, so they can't tell you that they're itchy, but it does not affect incidence or severity of allergic reaction, transfusion reactions either. Corticosteroids, I have not seen um, any RCTs or any really good um, investigations as to whether corticosteroids can prevent these reactions. But for most patients, again, premedicating with Tylenol, with Benadryl is treating the clinician, not the patient. We shouldn't do it. So that's true for most. Again, what is the, the most common cause for the first allergic reaction? Um, it is random luck. They have an allergen that was in that unit. We don't expect them to have allergic reactions with the next transfusion, right? Unless they were doing a blood drive at a peanut festival, which sounds like a terrible idea, and the person has peanut allergies, we don't expect it from every single blood product. However, if the patient is reacting every time you transfuse, they get an allergic reaction, particularly if it's getting worse and worse, then that might be because there is something that is normal, not the peanut allergen is not normal, but something that is normal that we expect there to be in every plasma unit and every blood product. And um, certainly on the exam, <laughs> on the exam, 100%, and in real life, 70%, we have to think of IgA deficiency. So this is the most common immunodeficiency worldwide. Recognize that when we say worldwide, uh, IgA deficiency is really seen mostly in European. So worldwide, that is European descent. Um, again, we expect there to be IgA in most blood products. So if someone is IgA negative, meaning they make no IgA, when they get exposed to IgA, they can make an antibody. And if they happen to make an IgE, anti-IgA, then they're going to have an allergic reaction every time you transfuse. And for those patients, you have to give IgA negative blood products. That's either wash red cells, wash pla platelets, or plasma from IgA negative patients. Um, is this 100% of allergic reactions in the real world? No. There's lots of other ones, and um, happy to come back and do another talk on that. Uh, but there are lots of other things that can cause allergic reactions. Um, but IgA is the one, again, on the exam, it's always IgA. In real life, that is something you should look at first. 
but don't uh, don't assume that that absolutely is the only thing that can cause it. It's not. Okay. Next transfusion reaction. Now this is one that's different. Hold on. Um, so most of the transfusion reaction, the quote, air quotes here, weird thing has been something coming with the donor, right? It's been antibodies coming from the donor, uh, bacteria, allergens, something coming across with the donated platelets or red cells or plasma. But for post-transfusion purpura, it's the recipient that's the weird thing. So recognize, so um, we're going to be talking about HPA. So HPA, there is a whole system of antigens that are only expressed on platelets. That's why the name HPA is human platelet antigens. These are only expressed on platelets. They're expressed mostly on the 2B3A or 159 receptors. Um, and just like other antigens, or other, anything else you make in the body, if uh, how should I say this? Um, if you get exposed to something that you don't make, you can make an antibody. So we're going to use HPA1A. It is the most common one. Again, on the test, it's always HPA1A. In real life, there's almost 30 different HPA antigens, and there can be any of those. But we'll use HPA1A because it is the most commonly one seen. So HPA1, everyone expresses. Everyone expresses two copies of HPA1 gene. HPA1A is the wild type. HPA1B is the rare mutant type. It's the rare um, allele that's seen. So here, the weird thing is the recipient is HPA1B homozygote, which means they don't have HPA1A. Now, that's fine. Their platelets work fine for them. Life goes on until they get exposed to platelets from somebody else. That could be during pregnancy, transfusion, whatever. And now their immune system has seen HPA1A and they made an antibody. Okay, no big deal. Life goes on um, until they need another a platelet transfusion. So they get exposed to platelets a second time. And now you have a brisk, right? Brisk anamnestic response. You get a lot of these antibodies made. The antibodies are going to bind to the, the recipient's platelets. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's going to bind to the donated platelets. And it's going to lyse them. But then the problem is the problem that causes post transfusion purpura is, and I'm going to tell you the unknown mechanism, but these antibodies actually start recognizing the patient's own platelets and lysing them. And I put this cop out on here, unknown mechanism, but I'm going to go into the mechanism. The real thing is that the difference between 1A and 1B is a single base pair change, a single amino acid. So the um, difference between HPA1A and HPA1B is very minor. It is large enough that the immune system can recognize the difference. And you can have antibodies that preferentially bind one and not the other. The problem is that these antibodies may be directed 100% against HPA1A, but they, but they still bind 1%, let's say, to HPA1B. And after that initial sensitization, when there were pulling numbers out, let's say 10,000 antibodies in the patient's bloodstream and only 1% binding doesn't cause any problems. But now you had an anamnestic response and now there's not 10,000 antibodies, there's 10 billion antibodies. And that is enough that that 1% binding with self antigens results in destruction of the patient's own platelets. So how is this gonna look? You're gonna see a dramatic decrease. Instead of platelets going up, the platelets drop. Got a great story on this, but we don't have time. So call me, I'll tell you about it later. Um, so the dramatic drop in platelets and not talking about, oh, we were at 45, we gave a unit to get up to 50 and now it's 44. This is, we were at 70, we gave a unit and now they're at one. That's the type of dramatic decrease we're talking about. It is down to single digits undetectable. And not surprising when the platelets are that low, you're gonna get purpura and ecchymoses and it's a problem because if you transfuse any more platelets, you're going to potent, at least possibly, likely potentiate the antibody production, which is going to potentiate this downward spiral. Um, so you don't want to give platelets for prophylactic, but it, but only if there is life-threatening bleed. Now these will spontaneously resolve. Like 
if you think of Guillaume Barre or um, AIDP as we're supposed to call it now, um, where you've got an autoantibody against a foreign antigen, you make a bunch of antibodies, but once the foreign antigen is gone, the antibody titers will naturally decline over time. Same thing here. The, their own self platelet antigens are not going to potentiate the antibody production. So the antibody titer ramps up in response to those foreign platelets. Now I'll destroy it out of the system. And then you're going to see the titer will drop over time. Once it drops below the point where it's destroying all platelets, you're going to see the platelet count come back up. If you can't wait that long, you can treat it with IVIG or plasmapheresis, and that will shorten, similar to AIDP or Guillain-Barre, that will shorten the time to resolution. Um, HPA1A, also known as PLA1 or CD61, we can do flow cytometry for this, rarely done. And it is on, like say it's on 3A, there are some of the HPAs that are on 2B, some of them are on the 159 receptor, et cetera. Um, last note on this one is recognize these are IgG antibodies. So if mom has is HPA one B homozygote, baby greater than ninety nine percent has HPA one A, and will make platelets during in utero, those platelets can get across the placenta, and stimulate mom's immune system, make a really high level of anti HPA one A, and those IgG antibodies can cross back across the placenta and cause this neonatal autoimmune thrombocytopenia, NAIT. And this can be one of, one of many causes of repeat uh, fetal losses, can also present as uh, intracranial bleeding at birth, or at least risk of it. That's obviously I'm over time already. Um, so that is another topic that really you want to look into. It's certainly on boards, but much more importantly, you need to know how to be able to treat that in the moment if this actually happens at your institution. Okay, last one, and I promise this will be quick because we don't know much about it. Um, so pain transfusion reactions, this is, and these are, have only been reported with red cells, not with other blood products. Um, start a red cell transfusion, patient has zero pain, and within the first 30 minutes, they get severe. And this is 15 out of 10 pain, most commonly hips and lower back, but can be up to the chest. Um, you stop the transfusion and the pain all goes away. Now, this is a diagnosis of exclusion. So you're certainly going to look for hemolysis, right? That could present as chest pain and flank pain. So you're going to do all of your testing, all of it's negative. Um, the, uh, so again, the pain disappears entirely, supportive care only. In all of these reported transfusion, pain transfusion reactions, there's not been any long-term sequelae. It is specific to that unit in that patient. If you restart that unit, the pain will come back. Do not start that unit. But interestingly, they've actually done studies where they found uh, pain reactions that were the result of a double donation, right? There are two red cells that were collected at the same time. They tracked back the other unit from that donation and that was transfusion to patient, no problems. Um, patients who have pain reactions, they're I know of one via mouth that, uh, so verbal communication that they had a patient that did have two pain reactions. There has been no published cases though of a patient having more than one pain reaction in their lifetime. And that's including patients who've had thousands of transfusions, had a pain reaction, then had thousands more. Um, so there's, we don't know how to identify which unit will cause a pain reaction in which patient. So we don't have any change to transfusion practices for either donor or recipient. This is not, I don't like having this slide. I hate having question marks on my slide like this. I would love to know the pathophysiology, but it is important to recognize that even knowing this is helpful. I can tell you, we had a pain reaction, a patient who had a pain reaction like this. This was a um, elderly patient with symptomatic anemia, symptoms of angina. So this patient needed some more red cells. Started the transfusion, had exactly this presentation. And the patient said, I, if that's a transfusion, I don't want any more. Thanks, I'm done. And the clinical team said, sounds reasonable to me. Yeah, we, were, we aren't going to transfuse. And that's wrong. Um, so I actually contacted the team, explained what we know about pain reactions, and that it was safe to start another unit. Is it 100%? Nope. Nothing's 100%. But we do not expect this a, a different unit to have the same reaction. Do not start restart that unit, but give another one should be fine. And she what with that those reassurances, they were able to give the red cell transfusion that the patient sorely needed 
with no uh, no pain reaction and no other sequelae. Oh yeah, I'm over time. I apologize for running long, but hopefully that was helpful. Um, and I think we're going to be opening it up for questions. And now you get to see my face. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, this was great. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Alkins. Uh, thanks so much. So there are a few questions online and uh, uh, let me see. So there is one question. Uh, is DAT negative in trolley? Yes, DAT will neg typically neg be negative in trolley. Remember that the DAT, we are only measuring, you're looking at the red cells. So I, I glossed over it. So HLA uh, antibodies are um, cause seventy percent of trolleys where we're able to figure out what causing it. The other twenty percent is a um, anti neutrophil antibodies, HNA antibodies. The other ten percent we're not sure. Lipid raft something we're we're not sure quite yet. But recognize that HLA is not expressed on red cells. HNA human neutrophil antibodies are not expressed on red cells. When we do a DAT, we're looking at red cell agglutination. Uh, so if you were able to do a DAT with neutrophils. Maybe, <laughs> um, but that's not the way we do it. And there would be so many difficult ways to actually get neutrophils out. Since most of them that are affected actually diapodes out of the circulation. It's actually one of the things you can look for is if you can catch it, there's a short window. You can actually see the absolute neutrophil count acutely bottom out and then it goes back up to normal. So there wouldn't be any neutrophils for you to test in that immediate uh, transfusion reaction sample. So no, the DATs should not be positive. That 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 should not. That's not going to help you in your differential of trolley versus taco or trolley versus a different reaction. And, uh, thank you, Dr. Elkin. So there is one more question. Uh, let me read it for you. Awesome. What do you recommend for a change in vitals during transfusions? That is blood pressure. Uh, our mm -hmm. clinicians almost never suspect a transfusion reaction. Any screening test that would you advise, like DAT or spin blood, something like that? And if this workup comes back negative, can you continue transfusing the same units? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's a lot in one question. So um, there are there are nice published uh, guidance for change in blood pressure that should be used for triggering reaction, uh, evaluating for transfusion reaction. Um, really, this is not going to be fulfilling, sorry, but the best is actually education of your clinician and your nurses in particular, and making them aware of the real risk and then saying any change that you're seeing that you weren't expecting, that should trigger a pause and inclusion of transfusion service, um, to help you evaluate immediately in that moment for a transfusion reaction. Any vital change, vital sign changes that you weren't expecting. So we put thresholds as most are used there. The ABB technical manual has recommendations for blood pressure increasing or decreasing. I think it's 20 points systolic and 10 systolic, if I recall. A temperature increase of one degree Celsius or two Fahrenheit, uh, but really realistically increase or decrease. Anybody who's seen cold sepsis. Right, a drop in temperature is also a problem. Increased tach tachycardia, tachypnea, but also any symptoms a patient is having, um, and that's really that's um, that's what I try to really impress on our clinicians that that's really the big issue is are they having symptoms? We do want to catch it with vital sign changes before they actually go into respiratory failure, but patients will usually tell you if they're having problem breathing. Um, as far as the um, you know, are there any, uh, how to say this, should you restart a unit? So for most of these transfusion reactions, you should not restart the unit, right? If you're worried about a septic reaction, heck no, um, because you're not going to even have a gram stain and gram stains have, do not have enough sensitivity. So a negative gram stain doesn't rule it out. You're not going to have your culture results to the next day, get a different unit. Um, hemolysis, if there's actually hemolysis, no. Don't continue transfusion, you will make it worse. The only ones you could potentially would be our two most common and most mild, and that would be allergic and febrile reactions. And then that is a conversation to have with the clinician 
of the rarity of the unit and severity of symptoms. So if this is a red cell for a sickle cell patient with a lot of antibodies, and you know what? We had to deglycerize this unit because frozen stocks from across the country was the only unit we could find for this patient. And the symptoms, they got a little bit of a chill, but they're feeling fine. I might restart that. And I'd say, re run it really slow. If on the other hand, it was just an APOS red cell unit and the person's having shaking rigors and chills, don't restart that. Don't do that to a patient. <laughs> so it, it would be wonderful to have a straight black and white, but they don't exist in medicine, right? The only place we have black and white is on my slides. And most of those are blue anyway. Um, unfortunately, we, it, there is no cookbook way of doing it, either for you guys or for your clinicians. It really comes down to educating so that people have at least the idea of a transfusion reaction and their differential and then giving broad. Um, so what I don't like is um, that there are a bunch of institutions, including ABB has done this to be helpful, is here are different guidelines of transfusion reactions. And there are institutions that will give that to their clinicians or to nursing and say, here, you figure it out. Not in so many words, but here's our guidelines and this is the type of reactions. And it, um, they're not simple enough and patients are not simple enough for that. Instead, what we want to do is educate our clinicians to think about transfusion reactions and to let us know, hey, this one's working weird and calling us and us, meaning the pathologist, the transfusion medicine specialist, being making ourselves available enough to say to be in the moment, helping them really evaluate that transfusion reaction and help differentiate. Right. Um, that's a long answer. Sorry. Did I catch all of the points? I think that was all of them. All right, no, thank you, Dr. Elkins. There is another question. Let me read that for you. Uh, awesome. In post-transfusion purpura slash thrombocytopenia, mm -hmm. deformed antibodies will destroy the recipient or donor platelets or both? That's the question. And if the recipient's platelets are destroyed, then why does that happen? Yep. And there's a second part to this question is, should I consider Glanzman thrombasthenia in a case of post-transfusion purpura? Um, okay, let me pull back up the slide just so I can try, I can try to explain it. I apologize. Um, so the, the antibodies that the patient's making are targeted against the donor platelets. They're targeted against the HPA, whatever, non-self. We're using HPA1A as the example here. Um, so that's what they're targeted against. They're gonna bind 100% against the donor platelets. And this can be one source of platelet refractoriness where you transfuse and the platelets don't go up. What could be because they have HPA antibodies. So not every person who has HPA antibodies will get post-transfusion purpura. Post-transfusion purpura happens when the response to the, the foreign antigen, the HPA1A we're using in this case, results in such a large antibody response that now the antibodies that are high enough titer that they're able, that they're cross, the low level of cross-reactivity with the self-antigen actually results in hemol in I'm sorry, not hemolysis, in lysis of the patient's own platelets. So the recipient's own platelets. Um, so the short version of your question, the answer to your first question is yes, it's it's going to bind to both. It's going to bind preferentially to the donor units. It is targeted against the antigens on those donor units, but then at high enough titer, it cross-reacts with the self antigens on their own, a patient's own platelets. And that's where you get the post-transfusion purpura, where you get this dramatic drop in platelets, not just the lack of increase, but a dramatic drop in platelets. And then you're asking about, um, Glanzman's thrombosthenia. Um, so you'd certainly have to worry about someone with Glanzman's thrombosthenia being able to make anti-HPA1 if they are a true null to, for the 2B3A. But most Glanzman's patients, they still make the 2B3A, if I remember that right. I always get Glanzman's and... Uh, 
uh, Bernard, Bernard Soulier mixed up, but Fitzclans, whichever one misses the 2B3A, um, they usually still actually form 2B3A and express it on their playlist, but it's a non-functional or decreased function form. So even those patients will typically express the wild type HPA1A, for example. So those, I have never, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't make this categorical. I have never seen any correlation between patients with Glanzmann's or Bernard Soulier or any, with post-transfusion purpura or with HPA antibodies. Um, might be out there, sounds like a good resident project, but we wouldn't just from knowing the pathophysiology expect that correlation. So hopefully that made, hopefully that answered the question. All right, uh, so there's one last question, uh, Dr. Elkins. So this is, uh, is there a best single test to differentiate trolley from taco? No. <laughs> Short answer is there, there isn't. Um, having having the, the best single test to help differentiate them, BNP adds to differentiating um, taco from trolley, but not on its own. No test on its own ever is best for any one thing. You always have to have the patient presentation. Um, so you, there you'd want to see, well, what what is the history of the patient, right? You need to, unfortunately, you have to have your di diagnostician's hat on at that point to help weed through pre-existing condition. What do we expect? What do the vital signs look like? Are there any changes? Did we pull an immediate CBC to see a drop in white count or at least in ANC? It really is a, and looking at the entire picture, sorry, that's a harder answer. Uh, the, the easy answer is always, oh yes, we have one test. If it's yes, you know it's yes. If it's no, we know it's no. That's just not reality, unfortunately. I think uh, I think these are the questions uh, I saw online on both YouTube and Facebook uh, from our viewers. And I believe that some of the questions were coming from our residents at St. Barnabas in New Jersey. And uh, I saw a question from Dr. Ali Rashid Baigi too. So thank you so much. And special thanks to the residents from St. Barnabas for joining us today. Mm -hmm. And we we had viewers from other places too. And there were viewers from Nigeria. There is a, a viewer from our colleague joined from Ukraine. And actually, uh, our colleague from Ukraine has a comment for you that uh, this was a very comprehensive talk. And he says that he's going to send this talk to our to their military medics, and this is a very important talk for them. And awesome. uh, we also had a viewer who joined from Pakistan and someone joined from Slovakia as well. So awesome. thank you all our viewers for joining us and thanks for your encouraging participation. So if you like our lecture, so don't forget to, uh, you know, I mean, follow us and let me tell you a little bit about our next lecture. So just quickly, so our next talk is actually tomorrow. So it's a lecture on liver pathology and we will have Dr. Ramil Saxena who will join from Emory University and she is going to share some liver pathology cases on virtual microscope and hope you will be able to join us and at 12 p.m. Eastern time and uh, it would be 9 a.m. Pacific time here. And again, uh, you can follow PathPast on our website, Facebook page, YouTube channel, uh, Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it now, and also on um, uh, Instagram as well. Mm -hmm. And thank you again, Dr. Elkins, for this excellent talk, and we really appreciate it. Thanks so much. It was Hope great. We would to uh, have you on board again. I and would love to. Thanks to the residents uh, at St. Barnabas, and thanks to Dr. Ali Rashid Baigi for organizing this lecture. Thanks a lot. Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks everyone.